ESPN Films 30 for 30 has been around for a long time. But if you go all the way back to the beginning, the season one, you had a documentary on Lynn Bias, the star basketball player out of Maryland, got drafted by the Celtics, but his life came to a tragic end due to drugs. And it changed the really the course of the drug conversation in our country. Well, this documentary, Without Bias, captures that fateful night for Lynn Bias and, and everything that happened around it, including a grand jury investigation, legislation passed in Congress, and much more. It was an eye-opening documentary and one that, if you haven't watched, we're going to tell you all about today. This is Distant Replay. So today we're focused on Lynn Bias. The documentary was Without Bias. Went back and watched it. It was one of the ESPN films 30 for 30s. It actually debuted in 2009. So it's been around for a while. I think, Mike, this is probably, yeah, season one, episode five. So this is one of the first 30 for 30s. And they were, and when, when ESPN films kind of rolled this, this new project out, which has become kind of its own entity and a, and a huge part of what the content that gets produced out of ESPN now, they kind of rolled it out with a lot of the, the biggest sports stories, right? To grab people's attention. And Lynn Bias is is one of the top sports stories of, I don't know, last 50 years, right? Yeah, because it intersected sports and pop culture. So yeah. I, I would agree with that. So he's the focus today of this documentary, Without Bias. We're going to take you through it, give our thoughts on it, on Lynn Bias, what we learned, what we were surprised about. There was some parts, because I'd, I'd never watched this start to finish. I think I might have caught some of it in 2009, but never watched the entire thing. So we'll go through that today. Our website, if you haven't visited before, is distantreplaypodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on any major podcasting app. We're there everywhere. But also you can find us on YouTube, almost 2,000 subscribers and counting. So please hit that subscribe button for us. Uh, leave us a comment and we would appreciate that. But also we're, we're on Twitter, on Instagram as well. So let's jump into this, Mike. So with Lynn Bias, you know, you look at his career and I think the first thing about him and, and I think everybody, at least our age, right? Thirties, you know, we, we, we don't, we were we didn't really remember the moment happening because we were probably too young for that, but he's still a guy that's always talked about, you know, all about him. But when you go back and, and kind of learn about him as a player, he had the ability and probably why this story is so big is he had the ability to be one of the greats in the game. Yeah, and he's the kind of player that you love to root for. You know, we all are a fan of a team where a guy is really raw, but very athletic. And as he advances throughout his career, he puts in the really hard work to develop all the skills necessary to be a top-notch player. And that's yeah. very much the story of Len Bias when he was at Maryland. Came in raw and then eventually, you know, wins the MVP of the ACC tournament his sophomore year and they win the ACC championship. And then his, that catapults into his junior year. He just takes his game to the absolute next level. And his last two years in college, it just is on a different planet. Yeah, because there's a couple things that stood out to me about this. You know, he, he, I guess, didn't make his junior high team, right? And I think they talked about how his goal from that point was, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm still making the NBA. So to see this guy kind of work towards that and develop and, and can kind of stick to his goal and, and get there. But then the other, other thing that was very interesting, Coach K's comment, or somebody else quoting Coach K saying, during his time coaching in the ACC, only two guys have kind of transcended the game. And that was Michael Jordan and Lynn Bias, who actually, you know, for a season or two, played against each other. Yeah, that's, I mean, anytime you're getting compared to Michael Jordan, and especially when he played in the same era as Michael Jordan, and it's a guy like Coach K making the comparison, it holds a lot of weight. It does. And, you know, even Dean Smith's still in this documentary before he passed away and, and talks about, you know, how his team came in there, the Maryland team that he played for, and, uh, and beat North Carolina for a huge upset. But his career was just, I mean, everything was setting up perfectly for him to, to kind of head into the NBA and be a really good player. The other part of this too, like the Celtics, I guess I never, again, like there's going to be people listening to this and say, well, how do you not know a lot of this stuff? Well, this is why we go back and watch the documentaries, right? <laughs> to, to learn. That's the whole point of them. So I didn't realize, you know, his connection with Boston, how how dedicated the Celtics were and Red, Red Auerbach, the president how much time they put into bringing him in, learning about him, scouting him, and being in a position to draft him when that opportunity came. I liken it to a lot what they did with Larry Bird when they drafted him a year before he was ready to come out. 
Remember that story yep. we went through when we did yep. the Michigan State Indiana State game? He targeted Bird, wanted Bird, and got him. He wanted Len Bias. He knew he had Seattle's pick, which was the linchpin to all of this, and that would be near the top of the draft. And Bias was the guy he wanted. And look, the Brad Darty ends up going number one, right? And the Celtics take Bias with number two. So that trade with Seattle, do you, do you remember Gerald Henderson? You probably remember his son. Yeah, I remember his son, yeah. Okay, well, Gerald Henderson Sr. got was on the Celtics. They traded him to Seattle for their first-round pick in, in 1984. They traded him for their 1986 first-round pick. Mm -hmm. That pick became the number two overall, and they ended up taking Len Bias. And the reason why this is significant was, remember, this is June of 1986 was this draft where they drafted Bias. The Celtics are coming off of winning a championship in 86, and that Celtics team in 86 is widely considered as one of the like, top five NBA teams ever. Mm -hmm. So the thinking is, man, you're going to add bias to this core of McHale, Bird, and Parrish. And as these guys get older, Len Bias is going to elevate them, and there's never going to be a stop to this. what the Celtics have going on here. Mm -hmm. That was the thinking when they drafted them. Yeah, I mean, you never, you rarely find a situation like that, right? Where, I mean, this this Celtics team was in won the NBA Finals in '84, lost in the Finals in '85, won the Finals in '86, and then they draft arguably. I mean, this was a really good draft from top to bottom, and and Darty was a good first pick. I mean, he he was a good player, but you had a chance to grab to grab another guy who could a elevate your team was could be a game changer, could be a star, and you pair him with everybody else on that team. I mean, it, it was. A, I guess a, a situation for Boston where they were just like, holy cow, we're going to be good the rest of our life. <laughs> yeah, it was the embarrassment uh, embarrassment of riches, right? I mean, they go from, you know, Bill Russell to uh, John Havlicek to uh, Dave Cowens to Larry Bird, and now we have Len Bias right here for us. You look at your history of, of Boston. Just, just I think I got off. that right. So I, I might have missed a couple years between Havlicek and Cowens, but I'm sure someone <laughs> will remind me. Well done. So he's he's drafted. So essentially, so what happens with this story? And again, I don't remember all the details. I just remember he he died early, died young, died of drugs, right? So he's basically back home to celebrate, right? He just kind of agreed on a deal with Reebok. He's he's celebrating like anybody would do. You go out with friends, right? So this night kind of, I mean, it's 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 an interesting story because both of his parents said they felt uncomfortable in the days leading up to this, which is very. You know, very powerful. They both felt like the need to pray, felt felt just could not sleep, like didn't know why. Then he goes out with friends. They they essentially just go to like the dorm room or the apartment, and they're just going to hang out essentially and drink and you know just celebrate, right? Some every college kid just about is done. Well, they introduce drugs to it, and I guess when we talk about this conversation, cocaine at this point, like is not it's it's a it's a big deal in the sense it's a drug, but it had a very different perception at that point. People, uh, people, the way they talk about cocaine from the eighties, I mean, this is not just, this is not the only documentary where you hear them talk about it. It's thought to be like a designer high end drug and people just like, didn't know the potential impacts of it. That's the way everyone makes it sound like even like smart people, smart, educated people make it sound like we didn't know the potential impacts. It's kind of like people talk about weed now, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, like, Hey, it, it's just cocaine. Right. Just a party drug. Right. So we're going to have some fun hit the club up. We're going to stay up all night. And that's kind of how it felt. So that's why it wasn't a huge deal. And then at this time too, the NBA has got a drug problem going on as well. And it's all about cocaine, right? We're not in the thick of it with the NBA. You know, we're in the middle of the Larry Bird, Magic Johnson era. But remember like the, the cocaine issues are still there. We're just not, it's just not the focus of the entire league. Like it was in the late seventies before Magic and Bird got there. Yeah. Well, this whole night, what happens is they're, they're drinking and partying. There's teammates coming in and out. He's hanging out with a guy, Brian Tribble, who sat sat down and you know spoke pretty candidly about this doc during in, the, in this documentary about that night because he's he was the main associate. They they met up. He was with his girlfriend at the time. Uh, broke away, went out with with Lynn, and they hit the the liquor store. Said they picked up some some drinks. Actually, the guy, the clerk there recognized him, got his autograph, which I thought was crazy. I wonder if he still got that. That's a, a different level of collectible if he even still has it. But they go back to the apartment and they're just drinking and kind of doing cocaine. He kind of talks like it's an almost a, a normal night, which you get two different sides of this. And I'm trying to kind of make sense of it. I'm curious your opinion. Do you think Lynn 
did cocaine and not like a, a ton, but you know, from time to time, like this was kind of a, not a normal thing necessarily even, but just, he was comfortable around it. He had done it before. It's just, it was just a party drug he would do every now and then. Or do you think truly like lefty Drizel, his, his head coach at the time said, I think, I think he just took it for the first time, did cocaine for the first time, didn't know what he was getting into and it killed him. The odds of him, this is the first time he did cocaine, this incident, I think we, we both know is very low. You know, mm -hmm. I think those odds are pretty low. I understand why Lefty Giselle or whoever else said that. If they really love Len Bias, why they would want to think that. Okay. I think it's somewhere in the middle. I don't think it was his first time. I don't think he used it every day. I think he used it socially, is my opinion, right. personally. Um, because they went through how the whole setup was. It was it was one of his teammates, Tribble and Len Bias. And they would just be hanging out, you know, doing some cocaine, drinking a little bit. And basically when the other players would come in that they didn't know if they would be okay with them doing drugs, they would hide the drugs. So that tells me like, this is something they'd done before. You know what I mean? That it was yeah. probably a pretty typical thing that they, they had done before and probably did casually. That's what I think. But again, I don't know how much I believe everything triple says about the night too. Right. Because, you know, essentially what happened, they say they're just kind of drinking and whatever. And then at some point bias has a seizure and then just doesn't wake up. Right, that's pretty much how it happens, and and they they end up calling the calling nine one one. That nine one one that nine one one call, Ben Tribble is out of it. Dude, I was gonna say that's exactly what wow. I was gonna say. It's like you hear that nine one one call, and he's completely. You could tell. I mean, it, it's like what? It's I don't know if I know the exact time on this call, but it's around five or six in the morning, or is it earlier? Because they call his parents, his like his teammate called his mom at like six thirty in the morning. So I, I assume that's a little time has passed since that, but. It's got to be pretty close to, to, to daybreak. That's that's a feeling I got as well. And and this guy, Tribble, is like gone. Because he's trying to explain like on the 911 call, which you'll hear in this documentary, that is like Lynn Bias. He just got back from Boston. Like not even saying, hey, the guy is 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 can't breathe, having trouble breathing. It's just like, hey, send somebody over here. Lynn Bias, Lynn Bias just got back from Boston and he's here. And, and the guy's like, what, what what's the what's the problem here, sir? So yeah, I noticed that too. Like there had been a lot of, it had been a long night, probably been a lot of drinking, a lot of drugs. And I mean, he is out of it at this point and still is able to call though and get the paramedics there and, and they get him to the hospital and, and everything else. And, and, you know, but I, back to this conversation on like the, whether or not he'd done it a lot, you know, the Celtics said they like drug tested him, right. And didn't find any sign of anything, even though they said, even if they did, they might've probably still would have drafted him. He was that good. But there just wasn't a lot of signs of it. So I kind of curious, like, is it, was it a one-time thing or, or truly like, you know, this, because it seemed like with this guy and they find out later that, you know, this is pure, almost pure cocaine, freebasing, which according to the documentary and, and me and you aren't cocaine guys, Mike, so we can't speak to how difficult it is to procure something like this. But they say you have to be either pretty high up the, 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 the ladder in the drug game or be, I guess, a pretty consistent customer to kind of know to go after this stuff, to have this stuff, to be able to buy and purchase this stuff. So it kind of makes you feel like Tribble, if, if bias isn't involved all the time, Tribble's probably pretty heavily involved in the drug game. Yeah, that's what I, I got the feeling that uh, he, uh, from all accounts, he was the one who supplied the drugs. So whether he was a dealer, who knows, he did face some charges, cocaine related charges, which will, from this incident, which we'll get to in a second. But from the information that was provided in this documentary, it seems like if someone was going to have a chance to access that pure of cocaine, it was probably Tribble. Yeah. Well, it's a pretty it's a pretty tough story hearing about the teammates and, you know, being at the hospital and his mom and dad. His dad obviously could not handle it very well, as, as just about any father would. His mom, though, was interesting in the story because his mom was just – she was the one that was kind of in control of the situation, very calm to the point – like did never broke down kind of speaking to her strength um, as a person. And, and she's kind of turned that into a life of, of advocating for kids to not get involved in drugs and not fall, you know, pray to peer pressure and, and this sort of thing. But like that whole moment, like I can't, I can't imagine what that coverage was like for, you know, the world I mean, that had to be, that was the story, right? That was the only story that people were probably talking about at that time. And it, and it truly, swallowed up all the media coverage probably in that moment but you, know, you hear you have number two overall pick just drafted 
And here he is, very little time later, has passed away suddenly. And it's just a shock, man. It's like, I, it's hard to, like, I'm trying to think of a comparison, but I don't know that we've had one in our lifetime. This is a totally unique incident. I can't think of another comparable. I, I think I could sit here and think all day. I wouldn't be able to think of one. Just the stun, the stun, like what? He just got drafted a couple nights ago. What do you mean? He can't be dead. You know, that'd be like the first thing that would come to your mind, I would think. I mean, then when the details start to come out over the coming days about what, what had happened and the fallout from it, I mean, we're talking about Lefty Drizel is forced to resign. The athletic director is forced to resign. There's a major fallout for the University of Maryland here, and they would take years and years to recover from this. Yes, yeah, this is the part I didn't know about the story was all like everything that happened afterwards. Like I didn't realize that the school was basically held accountable and, you know, they did a really good job here of, you know, saying like we always do, you want somebody to blame and they blame the school and, you know, the lefty was aware of a drug problem on the team and, and, and didn't do anything about it. I mean, situations probably that coaches face all the time that just get kept in house. And this just so happened that, you know, this one incident, became a worst case scenario, but I don't think it was the fault of anybody in the program just by this documentary and the information provided. But I didn't realize just there was a grand there was a grand jury investigation and Tribble was brought on trial for, you know, there is his responsibility in this act. Like this this didn't feel that like it this felt like a very different scenario because, you know, when people overdose, how often is there any kind of and I know this is a huge high profile case, but when is there ever this kind of investigation and trial with someone on in a drug overdose? I, it, to me, it seemed it seemed odd. Yeah, it's just it's it seemed like it was. Uh, we we want our pound of flesh, and we're going to try to get it, and we're going to try to send a message that you know the cocaine issues in this country are getting a little bit out of control, and this is going to kind of be like the watershed moment for issues like this. That's what it seemed like. It did, and and you know, hated it for Lefty, who this kind of I mean, it, kind of, it definitely changed his career. Who knows what he would have done in Maryland? He he he'd done a really good job already. But yeah, you know, the the other part of this this fallout was this is kind of when the country acted on drug legislation. Like, okay, cocaine is a, is a serious issue. Here here we had this young, healthy, athletic, um, in shape athlete that died of cocaine. We got to do something about it. And I think they did a really good job of of a. You know, pointing out how this how this kind of changed the tide in Congress, but then how they brought in a guy that claimed to have this extensive background, a detective that claimed to have an extensive background in in pharmaceuticals and drugs, and they used his what he I guess thought was a uh, maybe an offensible amount of drugs, and used that to build the uh, these heavy heavy prison sentences around and it's really kind of it's it that that moment and that legislation has kind of changed the course of so many people's lives and even so much so that now somebody involved in that legislation was saying you know we got it wrong like flat out got it wrong this small amount of cocaine we made a very very big felony when it probably shouldn't have been yep five grams of cocaine equals five years in prison it led to my, minor offenders getting very, very lengthy prison terms, and then that leads to a leading to like a booming prison population. Yep, and that's kind of where we got to today. Now, where there's you know there's talk about how can we reform things, and you know a lot in a lot of ways you can point back to this as being you know a big a big part of that. So was, I thought that was very interesting. I don't think we ever talked. I don't. I've never heard that that connection before. You know, with that. So that was really unique to me as well. What about what else about his death, Mike? Before we get to his brother, was eye opening to you, or, or did you learn about on this documentary? Um, I, I never learned. I I'd forgotten that triple face charges. That was one thing, and then the whole like we just mentioned, like you know, the whole cocaine drug enforcement world is not one I'm too familiar with, admittedly. And uh, just the, the the things that came out that we just discussed, I was not familiar with, and it was good to get kind of a. That's probably the lasting impact of Bias's death. Yeah, I think so too. And you know, it was already hard enough for his family. He had a couple of brothers and a sister. His, you know, his parents seemed like a really good family, which made this story even tougher to kind of get through. But just a, a, a few years later, his brother Jay, who is a good basketball player himself, who by all accounts took this extremely bad and extremely difficult. 
going through his brother's passing and, and just trying to cope with that and manage that. And from the, so a couple of years later he gets shot and killed, which to me, I've never once heard this part of the story, which is just so tragic after everything they'd been through. But, you know, even more so, cause you hear something like this, like a, somebody shot and killed in, you know, DC, which they document as a, very heavy cocaine presence, you know, you might automatically just think, okay, you know, some, he got in with a bad element and something happened. But then you hear the story, like he's in a, he's in the mall shopping and, and the person working there, maybe he flirted with her, who knows the story, but the boyfriend's there and gets, you know, gets jealous and is waiting for him outside and just shoots and kills him. Just an awful, awful story. And, you know, just unthinkable that this happened to him. Your, Your girlfriend works in customer service at a jewelry store. You don't think she's going to have to talk to people? Right. And she talks to someone and you don't like it and you kill the guy when he comes out of the mall? I mean, talk about senseless. I mean, these parents, I mean, and, and there's the biased family as a whole because he had other brothers and sisters. I mean, you go from, you think it can't get any more tragic than what happened to Len and then this happens to his brother, Jay. I mean, I wonder, when they started talking about Jay, Jay Bias, and right. I was like, Jay Bias, I haven't heard... I haven't seen him at all on this whole documentary. Uh And then you find out why. And that was a shock. The other stuff I knew was coming. I knew it was coming with Len Bias and the whole story. I had never, I'm with you. I had never heard about this ending and it took me by surprise. And it was like early afternoon. Like this happened at like one o'clock in the afternoon, the shooting, like, I mean, just, it is just horrible. And the one clip that really got me was his dad. Who's already dealt, who's already still kind of still, I mean, he's, I'm sure he's still grieving and dealing with, the, the, the death of Lynn Bias. He's talking to the media about just, you know, his now his second son dying. And, he, you know, he he's like, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he's basically trying to get the sentiment out that, you know, he's, he lost his son. He's feeling bad. And instead of saying Jay Bias, he says, you know, we've got to remember Lynn Bias. And like it hit him all of a sudden, like he, he's still hung up on Lynn and like this whole thing's all happening. He's got a second son that's passed away now and, and he failed to honor him. Like in that moment, you could see like, he felt like he let himself down by kind of forgetting, not forgetting, but not, not giving his son the the credit he deserved. And like, but you, you know, just in that moment, he's caught up in everything. And there's, it's so emotional that you feel awful for the guy. And he could like, he stopped the interview like mid sentence and, and just kind of like shook his head and, and felt so bad for himself and, and had to kind of walk away. It was, that was a tough clip to watch. Yeah, I mean, there's always like one scene in these documentaries that get you, and that one got me. When he started talking about how, you know, you bring these kids up, you teach them the right and wrong, you know, the right and wrong way to go through, you know, the right way to go through life, avoid bad situations, you know, bring them up and, and watch them become men. And then for them to get taken away from you, he just basically said it's is, is, is heartbreaking. And it's like, wow, you know, um, just a, just a, that that scene was like the one that got me in this documentary. Yeah, same here. But you, you know, the really good. I think they did a really good job of talking to some key people, a lot of reporters who were involved, um, a lot of media people that, that were very familiar with this. Covered basketball, been around the NBA for a while, got that perspective, and really kind of captured what this death meant. And but it was eye opening to me of just how like the impact it had. It was much more than than a guy tragically dying that had a huge future ahead of him, but it impacted so, so many other people in this family. And I credit his mom, who's, who's become a doctor since that, you know, goes around now and speaks to people and has become like a very high profile speaker. And man, I, I don't know. It's tough, like his parents, what they've been through, but, you know, they speak pretty openly about all this. And, you know, I credit them for what they're able to do in this documentary because I, I don't know how, I don't know how you get through that and still kind of have that as part of your life. I'd want to move away as far as I could from that area. Right. And just try to escape yeah. it. But yeah they didn't and you know this is 23 years afterwards too and it's still so fresh for them you know when they're talking to to to, uh the 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 people who did this uh documentary and um along with the parents as the parents were very good in this documentary his his family members i thought wilbon had good perspective because he was a reporter in dc in the dc area at that time um along with james brown i thought he was good as well because he's from dc and gave a unique perspective and then all the other big time, you know, basketball figures that were in this documentary and who were mentioned in this documentary. I mean, Len Bias's mother said the first two bouquets of flowers she got at the house after Len passed away were from Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. Yeah. So uh, just in the, his parents even talk about this, just they didn't even know like how much 
their son impacted people. And I thought that was um, pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely recommend going back to this one. Um, Lynn Bias, guy you probably heard about. If you, if you don't know the complete story, this documentary does a really good job of covering that, um, as you would expect from a 30 from 30. But this is what this is one of the early ones, fifth fifth one and se- fifth episode in season one. So this is kind of as this whole series was launching. It was a huge deal and still is now to this day. I've got podcasts and, and so much other stuff around the 30 for 30 brand. But, you know, this is one of the very early movers. But it's an eye opener, man. It's a tough one. It's, it's a very heavy episode and a very he- heavy documentary. But. I think it's an important one when you're uh, kind of telling the story and remembering who, who Lynn Bias was and, and what he could have been. Couldn't agree more. It's a, it's a cautionary tale, but one I think people need to hear. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you have any shows, any documentaries you want us to watch, let us know that as well. But uh, we'll be back with plenty more episodes. We've got more games coming up and a lot more. So please hit subscribe and thank you for listening to Distant Replay.